I was very nervous when I put this in the programme about whether we'd get an audience at the end of, uh, of Tuesday um, and made even more nervous when um, it became apparent that there was going to be the strike on the Dockland Light Railway. So thank you very much for staying on for this. Um, it needs to be regarded as a success because I'm hoping that we'll run this session at the end of every Tuesday um, for as long as I'm at World Travel Market. What I wanted us to do today was to talk about how people make change. Because responsible tourism, if you remember, the difference between sustainable and responsible tourism is that it's about what you do to make tourism more sustainable. So it's about how you take responsibility. It is about how you make change. So when I thought about who should chair this, it occurred to me that a very good person to do it would be Martin Brackenbury, who's had years of experience of making change in the industry. And it would be really interesting to have him um, ask the panellists the questions after they've um, made the presentations. But I'm sure there will be an opportunity to go to the floor. And one of the great benefits of it being the six o'clock session is we don't have to finish exactly on time. So if it runs over, that's fine. So... I'm really pleased to see you all here. I'm going to hand over to Martin. And Martin, who, is, who do you want to speak first? Mr. Barr. Oh, it's not right, he has to come up here, yeah. yeah. Oh, there. Mr. Barr, you have to come up here. Mr. Barr, oh. yeah, okay. Because you can't run this thing from anywhere else. Okay. He's going to run it all. There you go. And if just if you're bored, please tell me, because I may have to repeated this many times now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's that blank thing? Okay. <laughs> now, for me, I think the spark for me was actually when in 1995 we had a travel advice in the Gambia. And for the first time, uh, we t started to question why should a foreign country issue a travel advice and it actually stop the whole industry. So there must be something wrong. This thing is not sustainable. That was the issue. And when we had the travel advice, it just stopped everything in the country. I mean, it came at a time in November when the hotels were already stocked full. People sat for six months without job and just employed for the season to start. And then we had a travel advice because there was a push in my country and that stopped everything. And for me, that was really the thing that sparked me because I started to question how sustainable is this economic thing that we all cherished over the years and talked about if one day someone can just pull this out. And I like this. Uh, I like people to be calm and be critical, of course. And what happened after that is I was, I was a general manager then, and I started to campaign. Left my job as a general manager and started a Gambia Tourism Concern, which was mainly looking at sustainability and campaign for better forms of tourism. Now, this also coincided with VSO doing some campaigning work and Tourism Concern UK. And this campaigning work was actually about traveling to a fairer world. And they needed someone from the destination who can talk more about experiences within the destination, and that's how I was engaged, and went throughout the world campaigning for better forms of tourism. I also, of course, was a regular speaker at the Tourism European Network, and that actually exposed me to a lot of countries, not only UK, but Germany, Switzerland, and everywhere where we had a meeting, and the whole ball was actually going on. But then I was also uh, intrigued by what I saw in London, uh, especially the homeless people. And I, the first time I saw that, I could not understand how people could be homeless in this country. 
And I tried to find out who was behind it, and I understood it was John Bird, who had an office somewhere in London. And I went, I approached him, I said, what are you doing? And he showed me everything about the big issue, and I was actually inspired by that too. And I started looking at uh, 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 issues of outcast, those who are thumb outcasts in, in, in my country. And that's how I got the bombsters. If, you go, if you've been to the Gambia, you'll know stories about the bombsters. They're young people who are trying to make a living and go on the beach. Uh, they, they actually don't take no for an answer. Anyone can actually make money. They can make money from anybody. And that's how I started linking that bombster thing to the big issue, and I started working with the big issue on different issues. Uh, in 1999, I met up with Harold in New York. It was the first UN Commission for Sustainable Development Conference. And we came out from New York with flags of multi-stakeholder partnerships. That to make tourism work, we need to work with all the partners within the destination. And I invited Harold to come to the Gambia uh, and we organized a, 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 a big conference, mainly looking at smaller enterprises. And from that on, we've been working on destination management issues. We worked on the informal sector, uh, how to make the tourism market accessible to them. And of course, that's where I knew uh, the gentleman here, because we invited him too to the Gambia to talk to us mainly about how tour operators operate, because then, the enemy was the tour operators. So we wanted to know how these people operate, and of course we invited him. And it was a very good insight of how this industry worked when he came to the Gambia. We also had, and we managed to convince the government to send some government representatives to Cape Town and actually participated in that whole process. And when they came back, they actually were convinced of responsible tourism being the way uh, forward for the Gambia. And then, of course, we had a responsible tourism partnership. And in 2004, we had an RT policy launch in the Gambia through all that interaction. After that, I actually started to campaign, yes, yeah, started to work, but then taught project management too. I, I was involved with the Travel Foundation. Uh, we trained the informal sector. We introduced gate fees at places, communities, where the tour operators were going. Uh, we did an agricultural linkage problem, uh, uh, a project where hotels were encouraged to buy directly from the poor women in the gardens. We, of, of course, did also an environmental project. Important uh, to make a link with the informal sector and communities was actually building capacity. We engage with that too. And up to now, I'm engaged with uh, uh, Sally and Kate on volunteering projects. Uh, we had 20 MSc students uh, giving scholarships by the Commonwealth. Uh, I'm also engaged with South Nottingham College uh, in various ways. Uh, we set up an institute of travel and tourism in the Gambia, and this was followed by actually a Camp Africa, where every year we have students coming from different parts of Africa and Europe to come together and debate and talk and look at various issues surrounding responsible tourism. The lessons I have learned, I have only eight minutes, so, is for change to happen, there must be the need for change and the will. But the will encompasses everybody. It's not only you. That will must come from government. It must come from the NGOs. It must come from, from, from the private sector, the industry. Everybody must have that will for change to happen. Otherwise, you have uh, a, a lot of problem. It's more than being an armchair revolutionary. You walk the talk. You make it happen. Because that's the only way uh, you can actually uh, 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 be, be, be satisfied that this is not just a campaigning thing, but actually from that, I learned a lot of things from actually making things happen. For example, a good example is big hotels. I saw them as an enemy before, all these big hotels. But when I started with the, with the Gambia is Good project where I link hotels to buy-in, a smaller hotel will buy something like a 10 kilo of tomato 
which has little impact on the farmers, but a bigger hotel will buy one ton from me. Then I thought, wow, this is having much more impact than actually a smaller hotel. So we move from seeing, I move from seeing only niche as the best thing to actually looking at tourism from a different angle. That is, all forms of tourism can be actually made, made better if you actually put all the planning and all the other aspects that are necessary. Be ready to change your tactics, not your principles. Uh, I remember someone called me once and said, oh, Adam, why are you working with the tall operators? You capitulated. You know, this was not the norm, you know? These guys, they're exploitative. I said, no, you know, I have to look at what works within my own situation. Uh, you need to look at what works. Uh, I mean, after all, it's the big tour operators that bring the tourists. If you isolate them, <laughs> how will the smaller ones and the niche tourism work? It's not possible in my country. And therefore, you need to find ways of working with whoever is ready to work, but also ready to change. That is important. Build consensus uh, around believers. It's really important to actually work with people, help them in their capacity, so that they are convinced at the end of the day. Avoid being a paper tiger means don't be scary outside, whilst inside nothing happens. You must make an impact. Impact you must make. And constantly you have to monitor to see whether you are really making an impact or not. This is where I started. First Sustainable Tourism Conference. I'm sure you will recognize some people there. That's Tricia Barnett. That's Sue Hoddle. They came to the Gambia in 1995. And Sue came working for VSO. And we worked together on setting up the first conference on sustainable tourism in 1995. Where am I going? We are trying to build an institute. I don't know whether it's impossible, but we are trying all we can. If you know, please, where we can find money, tell me. <laughs> that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build an institute, and that's where we are now, because I think after all this gray hair, I have to give a lot to younger people, younger generation. So having an institute where I actually teach, lecture, or do research, or you know, talk to young people, on what responsible tourism is and all the other things about sustainability is the future for me. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes. Adama, um, that's very interesting, but you started your um, story in 1995, and you have a story which goes far further back than that. <laughs> And the people here, and I am included in this, are interested in each of the participants here as individuals. And so uh, if one goes back further in your life and to see what were the key kind of changes which m actually in your life eventually led to where you started your story with us today in 1995? I mean, I can say far back in the mm -hmm. 60s, you all know, those mm -hmm. who lived the 60s, it mm -hmm. was really a radical era. Mm -hmm. And it also happened that we are all, even though we were in school, we were talking about Africa's independence. Mm -hmm. So there was some sort of a political consciousness mm -hmm. of actually being independent uh, of actually working hard to make mm -hmm. things happen. Uh, disregard all the disappointments we have now with African <laughs> leaders. Mm -hmm. But there was that dynamic drive mm -hmm. to make a change in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm a son of that era. Mm -hmm. And constantly, I have all the time been critical. Mm -hmm. I have been in journalism, I have been writing, I have been jailed in prison mm -hmm. through my political activism. So I think that was actually the drive uh, to be critical and when I got into tourism and it became my field, that actually mm -hmm. continued. Mm -hmm. and, and it brought a lot of change in my life. Mm -hmm. And not actually, I mean, I didn't go to university. That gentleman took me to universities when I was 60, mm -hmm. you know, because we didn't have that time to go to university. Mm -hmm. But we had the time to read, mm -hmm. to learn, to search. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, unfortunately, I don't see that much with 
the younger generation today. But during my time, it was that drive that we had mm -hmm. for Africa to change, mm -hmm. uh, anti appetite struggles, mm -hmm. all that actually, I think, molded me to be somewhat radical, mm -hmm. I can call it so. And that actually continued the pattern of questioning everything, not just accepting things as they are, but being critical. Yeah. Because what that what you've managed to convey is someone who has taken responsibility for your life your, and your actions uh, right from the very beginning. And you've in, encouraged other people to take part in that because you know you can't do things on your own. Of course. Um, of so course. I think that's a very useful start. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay. If you take a seat there and we then have our thank you. next uh, person. So, I think that's so, who are we going to have next? Why don't we have Jo? Mm -hmm. You happy to? Yeah. Mm? Good, thank you. So, Jo Hendricks is partner in Global Spirit Responsible Tourism. And Harold will manage the technology. <laughs> Eventually. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Martin. Um, so my name's Jo Hendricks. Um, many of you might be familiar with me at World Travel Market previously, um, but in a completely different role. And uh, I used to work as the Sustainable Destinations Manager at Thomas Cook. Um, but part of my change most recently has been to establish Global Spirit, which is a partnership with my business partner, Hayley Liner, who's just at the front of the room here. Hmm. And between us, we realise that we've got a passion for responsible tourism, but we've also got a really great skill set that we're able to bring into the industry to be able to drive practical changes. So I've got lots of operating experience from a tour operator background. I was with Thomas Cook for around about 15 years altogether, and that includes roles as an overseas representative in the beginning, health and safety, and then moving into the sustainability role. And Hayley brings a business background that isn't something I've ever really been engaged with. So having always worked with a company, then a business focus, a marketing focus, a communications focus is something that I lacked personally. So together, that makes for a really good team. And what we wanted to be able to do was use that background to continue to drive changes in tourism, but in the areas that we felt particularly passionate about ourselves. So when you do work for yourself, when you have got your own agenda and your own drive, then you can really choose what you want to do and you don't need to necessarily be limited by perhaps what might happen if you work for a corporate or for another organisation. So we see ourselves as Global Spirit now as a key pivotal change maker within tourism and we've put ourselves centrally in the picture there up on the screen because what we want to be able to do, and I think it's critical, and Adam alluded to it earlier, is bring people together to work towards positive change. A lot of people do have the same agendas, they have the same objectives, but we can take very different paths to get there. And ultimately, we duplicate work and we make it a lot more complicated than it needs to be. So in choosing our services and looking at what we were going to offer to the tourism industry, we looked at what we both really enjoyed and what we knew we would constantly have that passionate drive to deliver. So from a tour operating perspective, we were also able to draw on what we think the industry needs or what I knew I would have needed from a consultancy or a, a, a sustainable consultancy company whilst still working at Thomas Cook. So we've taken um, a new approach, really, a different approach, something that people aren't really doing, and this is where we want to really now start to drive some change within the industry itself. So we saw a gap in between some of the issues that I think Adam has said, you know, people are there to be armchair campaigning. There's a lot of that going on at the moment in terms of animal welfare and tourism and all of the issues that surround that. There's a lot of animal welfare science and there are some amazing guidance that ABSA has put together around how you can work alongside animals in tourism. But there's a disconnect between the science and actually being able to practically implement 
those guidelines. So where we saw the opportunity for change and to make sure that you know, those ABTA guidelines don't just stay on a shelf and not get used by people was that we use that to bring those to life. So that's what we're currently involved in. The way that we think we're making a difference in this and how we know that this is going to create change is because we're taking the time to minimise what can be a very confusing topic, it can be a scary topic, and we're looking at how we maximise the understanding and how we bring that to life and make it practical. So it's, it is quite a different approach. How have we actually won support for that? We've been asked to address a few questions via the presentation today. And I think the key is that we've addressed a real need in the industry. And I think, you know, very similar to what Adam has said before, that there needs to be a need for change. There needs to be a will for change. How we've made it accessible is that we're using very simple language and we're making that complex issue understandable and we're taking it piece by piece. But we're also accepting that every tour operator or every supplier that we work with, they've got different needs. They need different things. They've got very, very different business models. So if we work in a, a non-confrontational, very open, flexible, we're happy to change our ways, we're happy to change our services so that we meet the needs of what those tour operators and suppliers want, not what we think they want. And I think that's why we've been able to, be, uh, to get the support that we currently have. I think as well it's been really important for a change for us is that we can actually be ourselves. And so the difference when you are really representing your own brand and your own business, that's what's been a big change for me, is that I can now be very honest about what it is that I want to, able to be able to achieve and what we feel passionate about. We're very neutral, we're completely impartial, we know that we have our own opinions on certain issues, on certain topics, but we don't allow those to influence necessarily how we work and we certainly won't judge any of the people that we work with. And we're able to, to create a really good balance between commercial awareness and some of the issues that people are currently finding around animal welfare in tourism. So that's given us a great niche, something very different and something that we know the people in the industry are happy to trust. We're not going to go in, we're not a campaign organisation. We can look at all of these different sides and we can bring that together. And that's been really important for us. What have we learned about making change? I think it's been really important to consider the wider implications of something so new that is driving such a different change in tourism. So if you look at the animal welfare agenda in tourism and you only focus on that, you're potentially then going to miss what are the effects on people's livelihoods? What are the impacts on conservation? What are the impacts on education? So we've learned in order for this to be successful and not to perhaps six, seven dominoes down the line cause a completely different problem, we need to look at this in a really wide approach and look at those wider implications. And we need to be flexible in that and be ready to change and keep an open mind. We really are engaging with people on the ground that have got that access to local cultures, because we don't want to assume we're coming in from the outside, we've got our ideas, we need to be sure that we're working culturally to take all of those different destinational nuances into consideration. So we've learned a lot from that. Is that my time up? Or was that no, no, no just... go ahead. He was playing with the toy. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> So I think what we also learned, and it's been 12 months since we created Global Spirit, is the value of change ourselves. So we're constantly re-evaluating what it is we offer based on what we're learning and based on how it is that we're working with uh, the people that we're currently working with. Would we have done anything differently? And I know a lot of people can take lessons learned from this, but I think perhaps we're quite new at the moment. We're, we've still got maybe a lot of lessons to learn, but looking at where we are now, we wouldn't have done anything differently in the past 12 months. We've spent a lot of time, very thorough preparation, attention to detail in the products and the services that we've put together, and they have been really well received by the industry. But at the same time, 
we know that in terms of our process and procedure, we aren't necessarily going to change what we offer, but we're going to be flexible around the services and the way that we offer those and the way that we open those up to, to tour operators and to suppliers. For our next steps, we want to do something um, quite different, I think, for a sustainable tourism training events, and we want to open these to be really inclusive, to make sure that the disconnect between head offices, the people that run the sustainability strategies, and then those people that actually engage with the people that buy holidays, the people that put the holidays together in the product departments, the people that sell in the retail stores, the people that put the online content together. We want to deliver what we're calling a really broad-based understanding of animals in tourism. So our next steps are to put together some really inclusive, affordable training events that are going to take place nationally around the country. And we're also going to help suppliers understand what we've termed their animal footprint. So for whether it's global, whether it's a small niche, whether it's captive animals, whether it's wildlife watching, we want to be able to give people a way to understand their status quo now, know the impacts that their programs are actually having, but also be able to offer them some really, really good commercially viable but suitably sustainable alternatives, which is one of the bigger changes that we're hoping to make. Our advice on change to others, very similar to Adama, I think. I think you've got to have a genuine desire to make positive change. I mean, obviously, we all see these things as business opportunities, but if you don't really, really believe that you can do this and you're passionate about it, I don't think that will come across in your work. So we are really, really engaged with the topic that we work in. Saying that, we also know that we can't allow our own personal agendas to be too influential. And I think we all need to be driven by a personal agenda, but you've got to respect that lots of other people need to take part in these conversations if we're going to drive really sustainable, positive change forward. And there's got to be a need for that change to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I, I, like with Adama, I'd like to go back a little bit um, uh, because you mentioned that you had been a rep at one mm -hmm. stage. So that is uh, delivering understanding and possibilities for people who arrive in resort and so on. Um, when was it that it began for you to be, as it were, insufficient so that you're actually looking for uh, other sorts of change because what intrigues me is that you set this uh, up uh, the global spirit up and it's in part a commercial enterprise but this particular enterprise you said actually is attempting to change people's perceptions and behavior yeah and I mean that's a, that's you know it's a small new startup that's quite significant and so you do have to have a passion in order to think that you might succeed in that. So where did you get that energy from and wish from? What, what in your story, personal story, enabled that to happen? And maybe Haley's also got something she can add from her side, because it's obviously a partnership. Yes. I think, so for me, as um, Martin said, I started as a holiday rep in 1997. Um, really not thinking about sustainability at all. I was more thinking, I'm going to live in Spain, I'm going to have a great time, the weather's going to be lovely, I'm going to get out of England, I'm going to travel the world, and somebody else is going to pay for it. And at no point did I really consider the impact on destinations. And it was only when I got into a health and safety role and actually stopped moving around and spent about four or five years in one place, which was the island of Gran Canaria, and when you spend the time in that place, when you speak the local language that speak Spanish, you start to engage more with people and you understand their feelings about tourism. And just through the friendships that I made, with whether it was with suppliers, hoteliers, then I really started to question what was it that we were actually bringing as a tour operator to that destination. And then highly amazing timing we were offered an opportunity as the overseas health and safety people to participate in a sustainability um, course of sorts which ultimately led me to being introduced to Harold and we had a, a very quick telephone call to see if I would be suitable for the course and we determined that I would be 
And then I started to study that from, at, from the distance learning point of view. And I, that's where I think I really thought this, it does need to change. How, mm. come, how can I be part of this? So I then developed my own little sustainable tourism team, if you like, in Gran Canaria. So all of the reps, I would have them involved in doing all sorts of things. I would, when they first get to a resort and you send them out on what we class as a resort ramble to go and find out what's going on, I'd start adding things in, go and find out what's local, tell me how you found this. And it was great because I got loads of presents. They bought all sorts of like things to eat and drink back from the mountains, from all places mm. they'd gone. But, you know, they got really excited about it. Mm. And then that's what I liked. It was something totally different Mm. And when you see how people engage with that, and if you can get them excited, and that's what I realised I was actually quite good at. Mm. And then, amazingly, the sustainable destinations manager role came up. And that mm. meant um, a big decision. So I had to leave Gran Canaria mm. and come back to the UK, which was quite horrible at first. But then there's a whole new world of opportunity opens up to you through that. And then it just got more and more exciting. Mm. And then I think the kind of corporate tiring thing set in um, and I was limited in what I could do so I'd started to achieve a lot and then we were or I was potentially having to face a change in how it was going to be or how sustainability was going to work um, at Thomas Cook and I just thought it's it's a sign I either I've got to go out we've got to do this on our own mm. if we want to continue doing mm. what we're good at mm. and at that time there's lots of sequential things have happened in time I think and that's where I met Haley because I know I've not got the business capacity to set up global spirit on my own mm. and Haley didn't have the tour operating background so between us it was just yeah it was the the perfect timing mm. and now yeah. we are yeah so driven because mm. it's our business but we still want to keep making change and I'm only happy if I'm doing something that makes positive change for other people very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Justin, can you be the next to tell your story? Hmm? There's Justin Francis, who is CEO of Responsible Travel, among other things. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is not... This is not me. No, no. I'm just going to talk for a little while. <laughs> yes. uh, when, I was, when I was growing up, um, as a small boy, my dream was to be a wildlife filmmaker or a wildlife cameraman, uh, or perhaps someone solving world poverty working for the United Nations, or perhaps someone who traveled the world like Wilfred Thessinger. I never thought that I would end up as a business person. And in some ways, it's actually quite embarrassing to say that you are a business person. Um, why is that? Well. Business has a reputation for being good at one thing, which is pursuing profit and pushing everything else to, to the side. So it certainly wasn't my ambition to be a business person, but as I became a business person, I thought, if I'm going to start a business, it's going to be a business with a soul uh, and a business that aspires to create change and create change in tourism. Now. When I look at how change happens and how people create change, it strikes me that it takes unbelievable focus to really create change in anything. If you look at the world's great social activists, the world's great environmental activists, people who won a Nobel Peace Prize, you will see that they have phenomenal focus. They stick with one thing, they focus on it for year after year after year. The other thing that they have is a great insight as to how to create change and what the problem is. Now, when I look at the tourism industry, and for any industry, I see one thing above all else which creates change the fastest. Business copies other businesses that are doing well incredibly quickly. And so I thought, what businesses are there that are really good at responsible tourism that are doing incredibly well? I thought, does the tourism industry really believe that tourists want responsible tourism? And frankly, the answer downstairs on the floor, I think, is that the mainstream tourism industry, most of the mainstream industry, don't think 
that tourists care greatly about responsible tourism. And that becomes a colossal problem. It becomes an absolutely colossal problem in creating change in tourism. So what I decided to do was to create a business, Responsible Travel, that brought together the world's best tour operators in one place and to do a fantastic job at marketing them to the public. In a sense, I wanted to create such a successful business that the rest of the tourism industry looks at it and says, wow, tourists really love responsible tourism. And that is a journey, if I'm honest. Um, we're, yeah, we're doing all right. Um, we've sold about 100 million pounds worth of, of holidays. We're growing at about 40% a year, which is, um, which is a pretty good lick, certainly far faster than many in the tourism industry. And along the way, we've discovered a couple of other things that we can do to create change. We have, um, I guess, what you might call um, uh, a reward scheme, a feel-good celebration of the best in responsible tourism, which is the World Responsible Tourism Awards, which we founded uh, 12 years ago. That will be presented tomorrow on the main stage. I hope some of you will come. And then we also have the big stick. And the big stick is activism and campaigning where we target uh, bad practice in tourism. And for me, I do get personal around that. I bring my personal beliefs into my business and into the campaigning. So really the heart of what we do is, is to demonstrate to the industry that responsible tourism excites tourists. And if we achieve anything, that will be our biggest success. That's 15 years. I plan to bet it for another 15 or 20 years. But there's one last thing that, occurs, that uh, occurred to me um, someone once said is that, that activism is the rent you pay for living on the planet. Activism, activism is the rent you pay for living on the planet. What a wonderful world we have, full of free opportunities. Surely we all need to put something back. We have a rent to pay, and I guess that's why um, I'm wired to be a change maker. <clears throat> I, I'd just like to explore a little bit more because you're, you're right, you are a, a, a businessman. I remember I first, I think, met you with Anita Roddick mm. and I was wondering whether or not uh, that was... Uh, was she part of your education? Absolutely, Cent central to it. I think most change makers probably have... Um, one or more people that have been really influential in their, in their business lives. Anita was certainly one of them for me. And the radical idea that she had, apart from just having fun with business and doing some great stuff, was, was this. The conventions were that business is there to make profits and not a lot else, and that charities and NGOs are there to create change, but not really to get concerned with making profit. And her idea was a very simple one. Business can make profit and do good. It's not a question of choosing between the two. You can do both. And so that, with a radical agenda wrapped up in it, was a big part of my uh, business education. Mm. And uh, just looking at your business, as it is, um, am I right that um, were we to classify it, because in a sense it's almost without classification, would it be an online travel agent? Because you, you, you've got, you sign up tour operators, don't you, to work with you? Yes. I mean, mm. in modern language, we're more of what would be called a, a meta site, if you like. So that we, we don't seek to run the holidays, uh, operate them. There are others who do that better than we do. So we connect the tourists directly with the right tour company with whom they book and pay their money to. Tourist travels with them, and we make a commission afterwards. In the early days, no one could understand it, but you might think now that it's similar to Airbnb or, um, or Booking.com in that sense. But the excitement that comes from it is inspiring the customers, and that's what those businesses do really, really well. Whatever we say about them, they do a great job in exciting the customer. And that's what we seek to do, but around responsible tourism. How, what is the mechanism you use to establish whether or not the tour operators who are actually providing the holiday 
fulfil criteria for responsible tourism? We, um, we, we do it kind of differently. Mm -hmm. um, we have a set of criteria which the tour operators are obliged to meet, um, but not just at a tour operator level, at a trip by trip level, so every trip is screened individually. Um, but what makes it different is that not only can you read about that transparently on every single trip, but the tourist is involved in the process in evaluating that and feeding back. Tourism is very unusual as an industry. If you go and stay in the perfect eco-lodge, but you behave appallingly, leave the water on, fight with the locals, etc., the experience is not sustainable. So you cannot really deliver sustainability unless the tourist is involved in that. So what we do, screen the trip, tourists can read about the impacts, Tourist is invited to feedback on those impacts, we publish their feedback warts and all on the site and use that to engage them in the process and to spot bad practice and to help tourism businesses improve. So it's kind of like a trip advisor meets responsible tourism. So, um, Except for the only people who can write a review are those we guarantee 100% are booked. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, what, what I'm intrigued by is that if you've got that kind of... Uh, first of all, is, is the initial assessment done by the company a self-assessment? Initially, it's a self-assessment. Yeah. And is there then uh, another assessment that you also make, or do you depend upon the customers to make their own assessment of that particular trip? Customers, journalists, competitors, anyone on the planet can look at the holiday, can read what is claimed, can feed back to us, and we will look into that. Mm. Um, so it's completely transparent. Mm. Um, I think having just a badge where I or someone else has audited it um, has a place. But I think it's much more powerful when the tourist is, is reading what other tourists think about sustainability before they book the holiday, is thinking about that on their holiday, mm. is feeding that back to the tour company when they come back, and is feeding that back to other tourists. It creates a virtual loop where we excite the tourists in thinking about not only how amazing their holiday was, but also about the impacts. Um, are there any examples where you've had to go and knock on the door of the tour operators and say, this is not good enough? Sure. Um, mm. It's pretty hard to join responsible travel. So there's not many companies who deliberately try and misrepresent their practices. Mm. We've had examples where we've had to knock on the door. There have been examples where we've had to remove companies. Mm. But there have actually been much more examples when the feedback from the tourists has been fantastically helpful in improving the responsible tourism. Mm. They said, what do you think about this? What do you, why don't you change that? Why don't you do it differently? But more examples of that, by far, than uh, having to kick tour operators off. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, our last one is Sally. So, Sally, you've also got a presentation. And she is the Programme Director of People and Places. Hi everyone, my name's Sally Grayson and as Martin said, I'm co-founder of People and Places, uh, which um, is a responsible tour operator offering volunteer travel, basically, in simple language. So I was asked to come here today to talk as a change maker. And I think one of the main reasons I was asked was because we actually started People and Places to bring about change. It was the very reason why we started People and Places. Harold's name keeps cropping up. It's Harold's fault that I'm standing here. When I sold my business, I had two years of hedonism and then was looking for what next? And one of the things I did was go to volunteer in the Gambia. I had an amazing experience despite the organization I traveled with, not because of them. And I happened to meet Harold 
in the Gambia who was working with Adama. Adama was the man, when I arrived, there was no project. Adama was the man that drove me around the Gambia trying to find out what the hell I was going to do for six months. That's a whole other very long story. But what happened over the gin and tonic that Harold had waiting for me at the small hotel that Haley knows very well was that we started to talk about how we would stop this. So that's why I'm standing here. I think I'm also standing here because to, depending on what day it is for me, we've had some success. Sometimes it's that big, sometimes it's that big. And, it, and our success has been recognized. Uh, when we were only two years old, we won Best Volunteering Organization in the Responsible Travel Awards. But this one, in 2013, was even more important to us because this is why we started People and Places. We started People and Places to bring about change and campaign for change. So that one is really important to us. So, first of all, I want to point out, I have not done this alone. It's not me who's standing here. It's People and Places and all the friends, supporters that we've worked with. I used to say, can a woman eat an elephant? Yes, but not all of one, at once. And a wonderful Koza friend pointed out to me, you haven't got that quote right, Sally. The full quote is, and not without the help of friends. So, those of you that know me <laughs> will know that I feel very strongly, no, I don't, I am Bolshe, okay? So, for me to bring about change, you have to be brave. You have to be obstinate. You have to demonstrate leadership. Boy, do you need stamina. You need the help of friends. And you need integrity. People have got to believe in you. And you need to educate yourself and others. And in there, and I guess that's mixed in with obstinate and stamina, but it didn't fit into spelling, bolshe. Focus, focus, focus. The reason we wanted to bring about change was because Harold and I sat in this garden in the Gambia and said, what are we going to do about how poorly served volunteers and local communities are by the traditional sending agencies? And first of all, we thought his gravitas, my mouth, We'd go to the press and we'd tell the story. And we realized really quickly that would be very short-lived. So we thought, we have to do it ourselves. Where? Sorry. <laughs> Why isn't it doing anything? Touching the wrong button. I can't get rid of that. <laughs> Let's try. Help. <laughs> Click out of the box. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. So, my bad days. We are still hearing this every week at People and Places. We are. This was from a volunteer on the 30th of this month, of the 10th. This was just last week from a local NGO that is dependent on volunteers because that's ha what our volunteer travelling industry has done to them. And we are constantly hearing this. So we haven't finished bringing about change. We've only just started. To bring about change, I think... We don't even realize we need 
to question the status quo. I think that's what you're hearing from all of us. But first of all, you've got to identify what is the status quo and what's the problem with the status quo. So for us, the main, these are the main factors. There was such an unfair economic share of the cake. Volunteer sending organisations were taking £2,000 off volunteers and the community was seeing $50 of that. There was little or no regard for the safety of the communities. No child protection, no preparing the communities to understand what having volunteers in their village, in their homes, meant. And indeed, there was very little, yes, there were, most of organisations have health and safety policies, but in terms of how to be healthy and safety within a completely different culture or within a very challenging background, how can an 18-year-old with no experience be healthy and safety, safe in an orphanage? The trauma that that 18-year-old goes through. Too many volunteers were doing the jobs of local people local teachers being sacked because they knew that a large sending organisation would be sending a constant stream of 18-year-olds to stand in a classroom. No consideration for legacy and leaving knowledge behind disillusioned volunteers and communities and smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors, the marketing of these volunteer organisations mm -hmm. telling people they were going to change the world and that their money was going to support these organisations. So that was the status quo. Focus. Not on the old, once you've identified and you know, don't go back there. Look forward and keep looking forward with what you want to change. So, going back to what was the status quo, we as our core values decided no community should subsidise a volunteer. A fair price for all. The code, the context, the due diligence, the safe experiences for volunteers and communities. We work with local partners. We don't work directly with projects. It's, we believe it's inappropriate. We, believe, we be, work with people like Adama. We work really hard to find people like Adama around the world. We don't decide, oh, we'll go and work in Cambodia. We find a concert in Cambodia and say, OK, we'll go to Cambodia because we found a great team to work with. And we work with them on the codes and the context, and we can share, our local partners share, it's a pool of knowledge. We ensure informed consent for the volunteers in the communities. That means the communities do know who the volunteer is before they're going to turn up, because they've been allowed to say yes or no, they'll accept them, and they've learned about them and their skills and experience. We do not replace local, we insist our volunteers work with local people, not instead of them. And our local, and our volunteers have skills. Those may not be professional skills, but we match their skills to the needs of the community. Also really important for us, it's not what we think local people should have for their future. We are, work, we are sharing our skills to help them build the future they want. And through all of this, we try to be as transparent as possible. Costs, our codes, all of that is on our website. We were the first organisation, uh, certainly volunteer organisation, but we underwent an audit. Is Jen in the room? No. Yeah. Jen Bobbin helped us with our audit, which we published on our site. So when we made a claim, 
Jen said, prove it. And we showed her what we were doing. Three most effective bids for ch change. Anyone who knows anything about volunteer travel won't realise that we actually started the questions to ask campaign and that all the large sending organisations that now say these are the questions you should ask did not have those. Before, I remember the very day we started that at an exhibition called One Life, which was a bit, uh, Howard called it snake oil um, uh, exhibition, but there were a lot of volunteer organisations there. And we, on day one, I realised what we needed to do was arm all these people who were talking to everybody else with a set of questions to ask them all, which certainly got up the other organisations' noses. So that was one. Child protection. We're passionate about child protection. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a while in terms of what we did there and transparency, which I've mentioned with us, our unique audit in 2008. OK, I said you can't do it without your friends. So for our questions to ask, because we've developed the questions and we've also made sure we've given guidance on what sort of answers people should get. Who were our friends, our helpers? The press, bloggers, social media, because that was a message we wanted to get out to the consumer. Child protection, who are our helpers, our friends, our local partners, who help us do a much better job. Responsibletravel.com have been, Justin and his team, hugely respons uh, supportive. When I went to him and said, we have to do something about orphanage volunteering, he stood up there and did something. The German company is a, is a German volunteer directory. They've stopped offering orphanage volunteering because I talked with them. The other three networks are child protection, child care expert networks. I'm no child care expert, but I do know a man who does know. With our transparency, Again, our local friend, our local partners, they're complete. we can't commit to giving all the information we give publicly on our site unless it's provided by our local partners. They've bought into that. We have some corporate partners. We work with the Gambia Experience. We work with various universities. We've worked with other tour operators. We've been back to Adama saying... Uh, I mean, I have a line, decide what your core, core values are, never compromise those, everything else is negotiable. And our corporate partners have understood absolutely with us what is non-negotiable. My argument is you want to work with the best, that's what the rules are. Our volunteers have been hugely helpful, all our volunteers, Hayley will be able to tell you she has volunteered with us, as did Jen once upon a time, but a long time ago. Um, are, they have to report back to us. And those report, and I don't mean a, yes, I had a nice holiday and it was sunny or it rained on Thursday. They have to do professional reports. That adds to our transparency. And, uh, we're, we're, and Jen, as I say, has helped us hugely just report global is um, the organisation that works with us on our auditing. Are we happy? Not enough has changed. Our priorities? The balance of power is still wrong. Child protection. My understanding from my child protection friends, orphanage volunteering and tourism is increasing, not decreasing. Better giving, guiding people into how to give their money better. So, the balance of power that we need to do, we need to educate and talk to volunteers. Would I be allowed to do this in my own country? 
For the hosts, we need to work closer with the host countries and our local partners and people and people hosting volunteers that don't work with us. How do we harness this in a way that is useful and meaningful for us? I'm on the in the steering group for this organisation, which is a cross-sector initiative working on volunteer orphanage volunteering and tourism. And again, it's working with people and with friends. Can't do it on my own. Our own people and places. And travel philanthropy and my work with the trustee, people and places work with the trustees at Travel Philanthropy, we've made a decision because we want to be transparent that we will not handle the donations ourselves. We want Travel Philanthropy to handle all our volunteer donations so that it is very definitely a completely separate operation. To change, we have to learn. What have we learned? Be bolshy. But most of all, you need friends. What would we do differently? We'd make more friends. <laughs> We've antagonised so many people along the way, and that's my fault. But I'm learning. I'm getting better. And it's not the way antagonising people is not the way to bring about change. You've got to get them. You've got to get buy-in. And finally, I'm too old for this. I'm really too old for this. So I'm with Adama. I'm working really hard on finding young teams who are ready to go take this one forward because we're in it for the long haul. Thank you. No, it's all right, no, it's all right. Well, we've had everybody's uh, views uh, put forward and we've got individual stories. Um, are there questions that you would like to put from the floor to any of our excellent people here? Or have you got exhausted and it's six o'clock and you feel you ought to go home? <laughs> there is somebody there, yes. Can, it, can we have a... Uh, yes, thank you, Harold. Good evening, thank you. Um, I'm a food safety and quality consultant in normal time, but I've decided to go around the globe. And my main focus would be to work with locals, basically. Uh, the idea, I'm, a, I'm part of a big hiking community, and whenever I mention my ideas of traveling the world, I did travel before, they're all very excited and envious. So I've set up a business called Indigenous Prides to get them on board with me when I go, over, when I go basically traveling. The idea being to share with them the luck I had before to experience multiple cultures and the one I intend to discover further in time, knowing that my focus is on the local culture, the local tradition, the local way of being. So when I, when I heard you all this evening, I'm very, very excited because uh, basically your groundwork is what we're looking for. The main idea being we are hikers, so we just spend, we are usually, we go on the weekend, we go a full Saturday or full Sunday or the Saturday, Sunday, or sometimes we do a whole week mm -hmm. where we just go in the countryside and walk through the day. So the idea I had here was to get all these enthusiastic culture seekers to uh, go in remote areas of emerging countries to be guided by the locals through the countryside, through their spotlights, and in return, we just pay you guides directly uh, and that is basically a, um, a supplier directly to consumer uh, ideas. So I was wondering if it's something which is, would be in line. Sounds like a kindred spirit, really. Yeah. <laughs> is there another question? Is there another? Yes, there's somebody there. Yes. 
Yeah, um, my question is around this balance of power. I thought your presentation, Sally, all of the presentations wonderful, but I'm particularly interested in this power gradient between consumer and I think it's right across mm -hmm. the board. But I work at Middlesex University and my background's corporate and my job is to link academics with business, NGOs, policy makers, people, mm -hmm. grassroots. Increasingly, I go to conferences where academics in the north are telling academics in the south about issues that impact them. And frankly, I think we're never, we're never going to learn if we continue in this frame of mind. And, you know, there's something about change makers for me that's about changing the power gradient and recognizing that the people who are impacted are the people who should control the change. Oh, maybe not, you know, catalysts are everywhere. But I'm interested in this discussion and I'm delighted that Sally raised it. Because frankly, for me, we're reinforcing some terrible injustices by continuing. Uh, you know, the UN is as responsible as anybody else. You know, you go to conferences and it's the same thing. And when I speak to people from the emerging markets, they're sort of, they're cowered down and waiting. You know, in the research area, I'd be interested in Harold's view on this, sometimes it's like, who defines the research question? People in the Northern Hemisphere, sorry. You don't need an answer to that question. You know what the answer to that is. <laughs> yes, I'm wondering whether, Jackie, you have a, an observation quickly to make. Yeah? And... Uh, have you got? Is there anybody else apart from Gokka? Maybe. We perhaps take two or three if there are. And then we take two or three and then we wrap it up. That's yeah. right, but Gokka mm -hmm. first, and then if there are others, let's do those mm. at the same time. Hi, uh, my, question. Yes. my question is to Sally as well as maybe Adama. Um, your work is phenomenal. My only question is, is there any attempt by both your organizations on creating local volunteers? And this question is coming from the perspective that I work with about 50,000 volunteers. And there is not one foreign volunteer in that. They are all from India. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Is there anybody else with a question? I've been told we do need to wrap up, Martin. We do, I think, yeah. yes. Yeah. If there are no more observations... Well, about that, I mean, do you want to answer at all? Um, Sally? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 I think my answer to that would probably be that's not my role, Gopi, as a UK sending organisation. My role, I certainly would help and would work with any of our local partners to, to create a, a, their own volunteer programme and to my knowledge, five of our local, six of our local partners work with local volunteers, yes. Mm. But it, that's not my responsibility. It's not something I manage or I run. They manage it and run it themselves. And it works alongside and with our volunteer program or independently. Mm. For example, in South Africa, they have very active volunteer programs going into the uh, township schools. And uh, we work with another project in South Africa where they, ha they have IT, local South African IT experts, working at the IT centre that we work with. So my answer is, yes, it happens with some of our volunteers, and it's not my role. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been told that we must wrap this up, and I uh, thank you all for staying until uh, after six o'clock. I think it's been a fascinating uh, examination of people's individual contribution to making change. So if you can thank all the participants for a most interesting afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.